the invitation and the inviter by soren kierkegaard from preparation for a christian life published in 1850 translated by lee m hollander in 1923 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the invitation and the inviter let us forget for a little while what in the strictest sense constitutes the offense which is that the inviter claims to be god let us assume that he did not claim to be more than a man and let us then consider the inviter and his invitation the invitation is surely inviting enough how then shall one explain the bad relation which did exist this terribly wrong relation that no one or practically no one accepted the invitation that on the contrary all or practically all alas and was it not precisely all who were invited that practically all were at one and offering resistance to the inviter in wishing to put him to death and in setting a punishment on accepting aid from him should one not expect that after an invitation such as he issued all all who suffered would come crowding to him and that all they who were not suffering would crowd to him touched by the thought of such compassion and mercy and that thus the whole race would be at one in admiring and extolling the inviter how is the opposite to be explained for that this was the outcome is certain enough and the fact that it all happened in those remote times is surely no proof that the generation then living was worse than any other generations how could any one be so thoughtless as to believe that for whoever gives any thought to the matter will easily see that it happened in that generation only because they chanced to be contemporaneous with him how then explain that it happened that all came to that terribly wrong end so opposite of what ought to have been expected well in the first place if the inviter had looked the figure which purely human compassion would have him be and in the second place if he had entertained the purely human conception of what constitutes man's misery why then it would probably not have happened in the first place according to this human conception of him he should have been a most generous and sympathetic person and at the same time possessed of all qualifications requisite for being able to help in all troubles of this world ennobling the help thus extended by a profound and heartfelt human compassion withal so they would imagine him he should also have been a man of some distinction and not without a certain amount of human self-assertion the consequence of which would be however that he would neither have been able in his compassion to reach down to all sufferers nor yet to have comprehended fully what constitutes the misery of man and of mankind but divine compassion the infinite unconcern which takes thought only of those that suffer and not in the least of oneself and which with absolute unconcern takes thought of all that suffer that will always seem to men only a kind of madness and they will ever be puzzled whether to laugh or to weep about it even if nothing else had militated against the inviter this alone would have been sufficient to make his lot hard in the world let a man but try a little while to practice divine compassion that is to be somewhat unconcerned in his compassion and you will at once perceive what the opinion of mankind would be for example let one who could occupy some higher rank in society let him not preserving all the while the distinction of his position lavishly give to the poor and philanthropically that is in a superior fashion visit the poor and the sick and the wretched 
no let him give up altogether the distinction of his position and in all earnest choose the company of the poor and the lowly let him live altogether with the people with workmen hodmen mortar mixers and the like ah in a quiet moment when not actually beholding him most of us would be moved to tears by the mere thought of it but no sooner would they see him in this company him who might have attained to honor and dignity in the world see him walking along in such goodly company with a bricklayer's apprentice on his right side and a cobbler's boy on his left but well what then first they would devise a thousand explanations to explain that it is because of queer notions or obstinacy or pride or vanity that he chooses this mode of life and even if they would refrain from attributing to him these evil motives they will never be reconciled with the sight of him in this company the noblest person in the world will be tempted to laugh the moment he sees it and if all the clergymen in the world whether in velvet or in silk or in broadcloth or in satin contradicted me i would say you lie you only deceive people with your sunday sermons because it will always be possible for a contemporary to say about one so compassionate who it is to be kept in mind is our contemporary i believe he is actuated by vanity and that is why i laugh and mock at him but if he were truly compassionate or had i been contemporary with him the noble one why then and now as to those exalted ones who were not understood by men to speak in the fashion of the usual run of sermons why sure enough they are dead in this fashion these people succeeded in plain hide and seek you simply assume that every contemporary who ventures out so far is actuated only by vanity and as to the departed you assume that they are dead and that they therefore were among the glorious ones it must be remembered to be sure that every person wishes to maintain his own level in life and this fixed point this steady endeavor is one of the causes which limit human compassion to a certain sphere the cheesemonger will think that to live like the inmate of a poor house is going too far in expressing one's sympathy for the sympathy of the cheesemonger is biased in one regard which is his regard of the opinion of other cheesemongers and of the saloon keepers his compassion is therefore not without its limitations and thus with every class and the journalists living as they do on the pennies of the poor under the pretense of asserting and defending their rights they would be the first to heap ridicule on this unlimited compassion to identify oneself wholly and literally with him who is most miserable and this only this is divine compassion that is to men the too much by which one is moved to tears in a quiet sunday hour and about which one unconsciously bursts into laughter when one sees it in reality the fact is it is too exalted a sight for daily use one must have it at some distance to be able to support it men are not so familiar with exalted virtue to believe it at once the contradiction seen here is therefore that this exalted virtue manifests itself in reality in daily life quite literally the daily life when the poet or the orator illustrates this exalted virtue that is pictures it in a poetical distance from real life men are moved but to see this exalted virtue in reality the reality of daily life here in copenhagen on the market square in the midst of busy everyday life and when the poet or the orator does touch people it is only for a short time and just so long as men are able to believe almost in this exalted virtue but to see it in real life every day to be sure 
there is an enormous contradiction in the statement that the most exalted of all has become the most everyday occurrence in so far then it was certain in advance what would be the inviter's fate even if nothing else had contributed to his doom the absolute or all which makes for an absolute standard becomes by that very fact the victim for men are willing enough to practice sympathy and self-denial are willing enough to strive for wisdom etc but they wish themselves to determine the standard and to have that read to a certain degree they do not wish to do away with all these splendid virtues on the contrary they want at a bargain and in all comfort to have the appearance and the name of practicing them truly divine compassion is therefore necessarily the victim so soon as it shows itself in this world it descends on earth out of compassion for mankind and yet it is mankind who trample upon it and whilst it is wandering about among them scarcely even the sufferer dares to flee to it for fear of mankind the fact is it is most important for the world to keep up the appearance of being compassionate but this it made out by divine compassion to be a falsehood and therefore away with divine compassion but now the inviter represents precisely this divine compassion and therefore he was sacrificed and therefore even those that suffered fled from him for they comprehended and humanly speaking very exactly what is true of most human infirmities that one is better off to remain what one is than to be helped by him in the second place the inviter likewise had an other and altogether different conception than the purely human one as to what constitutes man's misery and in this sense only he was intent on helping for he had with him neither money nor medicine nor anything else of this kind indeed the inviter's appearance is so altogether different from what human compassion would imagine it that he is a downright offence to men in a purely human sense there is something positively cruel something outrageous something so exasperating as to make one wish to kill that person in the fact of his inviting to him the poor and the sick and the suffering and then not being able to do anything for them except to promise them remission of their sins let us be human man is no spirit and when a person is about to die of starvation and you say to him i promise you the gracious remission of your sins that is revolting cruelty in fact it is ridiculous though too serious a matter to laugh about well for in quoting these sentiments i wish merely to let offended man discover the contradiction and exaggerate it it is not i who wish to exaggerate well then the real intention of the inviter was to point out that sin is the destruction of mankind behold now that makes room as the invitation also made room almost as if he had said procol o oh, procol este profani or as if even though he had not said it a voice had been heard which thus interpreted the come hither of the invitation there surely are not many sufferers who will follow the invitation and even if there were one who although aware that from this inviter no actual worldly help was to be expected nevertheless had sought refuge with him touched by his compassion now even he will flee from him for is it not almost a bit of sharp practice to profess to be here out of compassion and then to speak about sin indeed it is a piece of cunning unless you are altogether certain that you are a sinner if it is a toothache which bothers you or if your house is burned to the ground but if it has escaped you that you are a sinner why then it was cunning on his part it is a bit of sharp practice of him to assert i heal all manner of disease 
in order to say when one approaches him, the fact is, I recognize only one disease, which is sin. Of that I shall cure all them that labor and are heavy laden, all them that labor to work themselves free from the power of sin, that labor to resist the evil and to vanquish their weaknesses, but succeed only in being heavy laden. Of this malady he cures all persons, even if there were but a single one who turned to him because of this malady, he heals all persons. But to come to him on account of any other disease, and only because of that, is about as useful as to look up an eye doctor when you have fractured your leg. End of The Invitation and the Inviter by Soren Kierkegaard